If you're new to sound system design and tuning and are looking for a pro measurement software to get you real results in the field, look no further. Today I'm walking through step-by-step -step through Open Sound Meter. It is an amazing cross-platform, pay-what-you-want model that you can download and start using today. If you are tired of guessing in the field and trying to trust your ear, but second guessing yourself when you get back in the booth, but really want to see and get accurate data so you can make better decisions faster, this is the software that you need to get. One thing that I think is going to really help you stop guessing even more is my audio math survival spreadsheet. I've got that here and it's available at the link below or at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. It helps you use real numbers and, and realize that there's, there's real physics at play when making a sound system. And you can use any of these calculators to get your real results in the field. You can figure out how a cone filter starts. If you need delays to know what type of speaker is going to be wide enough to cover a given space. Again, you can get that at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit or at the link below. I think it'd be a fantastic companion for you as you're growing in your sound system tuning journey. So today we're going to cover why Open Sound Meter can do everything you need to do. We're going to look at every single knob and feature in it and how to set up a measurement from scratch. So grab a cup of coffee, get the download, and we're going to jump through all of this and get to know Open Sound Meter really well. Here we are at opensoundmeter.com. This is where you can download the software and get it installed for your Mac, PC, or Linux machine. And it is on a pay what you want or donation based model. So you can click here and donate uh, to Pavel or Pavel, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, uh, to his cause and what he's doing to develop this. This is how he's able to put more time and energy, developing more features for us and making it more stable. So this is, this is, I really and highly encourage you to do that. I've done it, it's great. He's doing really great work for us. Up at the top, you can also download Open Sound Meter for iPad and that's available at the Mac or the iPad OS app store. And that is $49.99. That one's paid because it has to live in the Apple app store, but otherwise you can get it for Mac PC or Linux and start working with it today, which is awesome. Here's his about page. You can learn a little bit more uh, about him and what he's doing and the other things he's working on. So anyway, it's just really cool that this is open source and available to us and a professional audio tool that we can use. So now let's jump into the software, talk about it a little bit of a meta level, how it's different as a piece of software. And then we'll start stepping through each of the, the windows, the panes and functions that make it all tie together. Before we dive deeper into the software, my measurement setup today is I'm running Reaper and I have this digitally routed through a software called Loopback into open sound meter. Traditionally, you would have a measurement microphone running into your interface, then running your reference signal out of it and looping back and capturing both and comparing them, which is all neat, but I wanted to eliminate some of those variables and not have to worry about an extra environment. And I wanna show you that even if you don't have a measurement microphone or an audio interface, you could do a similar approach with Reaper, a $60 DAW, loop back and also very affordable software and pass audio between. And this is how you can practice with this software. It's um, a lot of people try to wait until they're on a show and you know, it, you're, you're on the clock, it's moving quickly and you're not able to get good time driving the software. So I want you to slow down a little bit and practice with software first, then you can jump onto a show and get really great results for you. So what is Open Sound Meter? So it is an audio analysis tool that is able to get data from an audio source and compare it against other data and give you graphs that show you how they relate to one another. So here I have this measurement that's coming in. I have a, if I click on it, I'm able to see a measurement channel and a reference channel. That's very common in what's called a transfer function measurement. That's comparing two things against each other. So my measurement channel is channel one, and that's coming here on, on Reaper, my measurement one, and I have an EQ on it that's flat, so nothing's happening. And then channel two is my reference. What's happening first is I'm running pink noise through both of those channels, and, one's, and my measurement's going out of output one, and my reference out of output two. So if I use a low shelf on the EQ, I do a nice big boost right here, I'm gonna see that same thing here on the magnitude graph. So very similar to a frequency response, but different uh, here in open sound meter. And I can see even the levels changed. I boosted 
uh, the low end on the measurement signal, so that's higher, and my reference signal did not change. So it's going to show me those differences. So I see a change here in the impulse response and in the phase response. If this is Greek to you, don't worry. We're not going to dive into all the graphs and the super nitty gritty stuff and how to read it, but this is at its core what it's doing. It's 99% it's of the time you're going to be taking a measurement signal, comparing it against a reference, and these graphs uh, we can manipulate different parameters down here that show us the data in different ways. And we're able to select even more uh, types of graph types up here, which is really cool. Again, we're later we're gonna step slowly through all this. I wanna show at a high level view what, that, what this piece of software is gonna do for us. Um, not everything requires a dual channel setup. So something like a spectrogram is something that only needs one channel. It's not comparing it. And same thing with a RTA. So that is merely looking at the uh, single channel frequency response slowly weighted over time for an RTA. This is different than SMART that there is not a real time and transfer function mode. These are all available in the same pane. What you'll see immediately is a big difference between this software and many other softwares that accomplish similar tasks is the lack of menus. If I go up to file, I really don't have that many options. Most of them are just key commands that, that make a function happen. I can select recent projects, or I can choose a different view, dark mode or not. And then the help menu, I can look at the shortcuts or check for an update. That's it. Even if I go click on here, there's no preferences tab. It's all shown to you in the software. And how do you look at it? So if you click on anything, this, this impulse response chart, if I click on the generator, if I click on the measurement, you can see here at the bottom, this properties bar changed every time. So I click on the middle again, it's just gonna contextually show me the appropriate properties at the, about, at the bottom. This is known as a contextual dashboard, at least in my brain. It's whatever I have clicked on, it is right here at the bottom. It's similar when you're switching to work on a digital console uh, from analog, you're used to seeing everything in a nice neat row of gain, EQ, compression, channel fader, right? Uh, on a digital console, you have to select what you're looking at and then the screen will change. This is very similar. So click on what you wanna look at and then the bottom properties bar. So up here on the top left are the charts, the right hand is the tools and resources bar and the bottom are the properties. File management and project management is a little bit funny right now. Um, I guess at least in my mind, this may make complete sense to you, but if I hit Command S right now, this is going to save this project. I'll save it to my desktop, copy this as my OSM file and as a .osm file extension and I hit save. Let's replace it. And this is a project in and of itself. If I previously imported any data into here, it would keep it. So I can import other trace and file types, which we'll get to in a minute. And it's gonna have this as its standalone wrapper of a file. What's also interesting is I'm not gonna go to Command I or import for this, but I can do Command O and I can open another .osm file within this one that is its own trace. So this is from a show I was on recently and I just took this trace of the PA and I'll make this measurement go away. And this is the impulse response data, the phase data and the magnitude data. So that's all here. And how I got that out of my other file and was able to import it here is I clicked on the actual measurement, which is stored here in the right and bottom left, save data as OSM. So it has a .osm file type. So it can either be the entire project container or an individual trace. And what that's going to do is it's going to carry the phase magnitude and then also the impulse response with it. So if I go to command I import, I can import a trace, either a .txt file or a .csv file. So this is a KS118 trace taken by Michael Lawrence. Thank you for that. He hooked me up here when I was working in a show that really needed some data for that. And I've imported it here and he was using smart and he captured it. And what smart does with that, that file is it makes a .trf and that carries the impulse response data, the phase data and magnitude as well as some other metadata in there. But OSM can't work with that. So how you get data from smart into open sound meter is you export it as ASCII, it's capital A-S-C-I-I. -I, and that's basically a file interchange format that can mean a lot of different things, but 
at the end of the day, it means is this a .txt file or a .csv file, comma separated values. So o open sound meter can open up a .osm file, which is something exported from itself that can carry the impulse response data, phase, and magnitude, or it can up open a .csv or .txt or the other two main file formats that it's going to work with. But the caveat and downside between the file exchange between another software like Smart and Open Sound Meter is that a .csv and .txt don't carry the impulse response data with it, just the phase and magnitude. So you're gonna be missing that. So if you're having a long-term project, we're gonna really need that impulse response data. Don't be hopping back and forth between softwares. If there's a better way for this, I'm misspeaking here, please correct me. But at the moment, I've not been able to get a .csv or .txt file to bring along impulse response data with it. So if you're wanting to have uh, and compare that, make sure you go to the trace and save it as a .osm file if you wanna be able to open that up in another open sound meter session and have that data go with it. All right, there's a little bit in the weeds there, but just wanted to have that out of the way. And now we're gonna step through the interface itself. We have the charts area right here, which shows us the data. We have the tools and resources tab over here. And then we have the properties bar at the bottom. The charts are probably gonna stay pretty similar the whole time and this, this resources bar on the side is gonna stay the same. It's the properties bar is what's gonna change depending what we click on. Over here on the charts bar, we can change the chart type so we can look at the data again. I have all three of these on magnitude if I want. But at the end of the day, this is just where, where you see your data. On the right hand side, the tools and resources bar, at the top I can have and see just a single graph or I can hit command two, command three and say, uh, also command one works here as well. One, two or three graphs. So if I'm wanting to get really granular and zoom in, I can just look at one and I'll pick the topmost, or I can go back to three, which is cool. Uh, the, the graph also gives me a crosshair readout, which is pretty cool. So if I, depending on which graph I'm selecting, uh, it's a little bit buggy in this part. See at the top, my crosshair stuck is here, but on the phase graph, it tells me the frequency and the phase relationship of that graph that I currently have selected. And I go to this trace. Uh, yeah, see, it's, it's a little buggy here as well. A magnitude, it, sometimes it gets stuck and I have to restart. So those are my graph selectors right here. And then I click on generator and here at the bottom, I see it change. I can choose the type of noise. Pink noise, 98% of the time is what I'm using. You can also use white, maybe for testing electrical gear. You can do a single sine wave or a sine sweep. Then you have Myers M noise, which you have to run at 96K for it to work, but it's an alternative to pink noise that they feel like is more musical and can pull uh, more real world data out of speakers that way. You can do the generator gener generators level. This is the peak level of the sine wave or pink or whatever you're talking about. And then you choose the interface for the output. So my interface here at home is the Zentor USB. And you can pick w which of your outputs that, that pink noise is going to pass out of. Moving on to our measurement, this is where you're gonna take data in from a DAW, from a measurement microphone, from an audio interface and compare them together. We're gonna to come back to averaging, but that's here on the far left. I can invert the polarity of the measurement. So if I have here, I can see my impulse response flip over and my phase response starts to do weird stuff. I can reset the buffer. So if I have averaging going, this would reset what's going on. I can also load a microphone calibration file. This is something the manufacturer sends you. You could put in, have the data there, it'll offset any of the imperfections in the mic's frequency response and then bring it back to cl as close as it possibly can to unity all the way across. I can rename it what's going on. So I can say Reaper loopback, a little bit better representation. I can also right click on the color. It'll change colors, which is cool. Or I can click and go to the Apple selector and choose what color I want. I can also adjust the gain of the measurement. So if I wanted it at three dB hotter, that actually is, that would affect the magnitude graph and it's useful for offsetting tra traces against each other. Then you have delay. So this is the delay and then associated delta delay. Usually in the field, a measurement signal is coming out of a speaker after it's gone through your console, a system processor, and all the way out, traveling through air back to your microphone. But the reference signal it's comparing it against is a, is a loop out of your interface directly and into an input. So electricity 
travels a lot faster than that other path. So you're going to have to tell your reference signal to wait uh, and be synced up with your measurement signal. And this has a built-in estimator to tell you that delay. So you can manually enter in a number or it'll try to approximate and you click and it'll boom, and it'll offset that delay. I've gone back here into Reaper and I've added a delay plugin and added 30 milliseconds of delay to my reference channel. And now I see here that I have an estimated delay and it's gonna clear up this data a lot. My phase response is gonna look really weird if it's not synced up. I can't even see my impulse and the magnitude trace up to 400 hertz is foo, or above 400 hertz is foobar. So I click this, it's gonna sync it up, find that spike in the impulse response and everything is back to normal. So that's what that tool does. Again, you can put a manual entry. If you hover your mouse over this, just in case you moved your microphone and it's a different sync time, it's gonna tell you the estimated delta and you can apply that, which is pretty cool. With gain, you can hit the up arrow and do increments of a 10th of a dB or hold shift and do it and it'll do it a hundredth of a dB, which is a little bit too fine, I think. I think this could be changed to dB and maybe quarter dB or half dB increments, but that's how you would do that. Let's move back over to our averaging and FFT type. So on the far left, I have an averaging, I could put it in FIFO or low pass filter. And that's basically two different ways of averaging the data there are articles on that and I'll explain that a little bit more later, but I just keep it on low pass filter and 0.25 Hertz most of the time, unless I'm needing a faster responding measurement. I put that on FIFO and I put it on 16. And here at the bottom is the time window. I think by default, this is at 12. And this is basically the length of the FFT size in samples as it's able to grab data and analyze it in those chunks. So this is two to the 12th power of, of samples of that buffer size that's gonna be grabbed and analyzed for data, or you can use a logarithmic time window. And that means that every octave for open sound meter, there are 24 frequencies that will or frequency points that I'll pull. It has a different time window for every band. And this is useful because high frequencies don't take long at all to go through a full cycle and low frequencies take much longer to do that. So if you are moving faster or actually taking longer to complete a cycle than what's going on in these buffers, you're not gonna get good data. So why not set up multiple time windows or a logarithmic time window and be able to capture these at that rate? So that's what I use for logarithmic time mode uh, is the transform mode that I use most of the time or you can use a different window function. I'll leave it on Han, that's the default. With the measurement channel, you need to choose in what is your measurement and what is your reference and the audio interface. So if you're out in the field, you choose your current audio interface, your measurement channel would be the microphone channel and channel, channel two would be where you're looping back in your pink noise. And that would be from your generator. Uh, or you can have it fired externally, but I have the generator from here, they'll come out interface and come back in. Lastly, you can click this button to store a measurement. So I've got this live now. I can see this trace. If it command X, it'll store it. We stop this. It'll have it at the color you stored it out and it'll tell you the time. So that's now down here. It gives me some really cool metadata down here. After storing the data, which I can use command X or command C, command X does a single measurement and command C will capture a measurement from all the open measurements you have because you can have multiple microphones going at the same time and it puts that down here. So I have that trace I've captured here and I love all the notes. I can adjust the level, which is great. If I need to offset it with any other traces to make it match and easier to read, I can adjust the delay. Here I've got the virtual delay. I could increase or decrease that and just look at what would happen. This is really cool if I wanted to align a sub with a main, but I did not capture them together. So I uh, can use and manipulate the delay to get them to interact with one another. I can uh, flip the magnitude data. So this is not flipping the phase, and that's a terrible way to say that phenomena as well. You're not flipping anything. Uh, you are uh, inverting polarity. So this would flip the magnitude over and is useful for a couple of use cases and maybe EQing a system and being able to see what the trace is doing against the room response. You can flip that over. 
you can invert the polarity and see what that would look like if the polarity were opposite. And you can tell it to ignore coherence. So that means if you wanna look at all the data, no matter how ugly it is, you can bypass any of the coherence weighting. And what the coherence weighting it's doing is that it'll actually give you a line, as you can see on this stored number four trace, near the end of this tail, it starts to fade out that means the data is no longer above the coherence threshold that I set. And same here with the phase data. So it's, it's, the line starts to get hazy where the data starts to get hazy. And if I store it, click on this trace, and it said ignore coherence, it's gonna give me all the data, no matter how coherent it was, it's just its best guess of what was going on there. We can again, right click and cycle through all the colors, which is cool if I want to quickly change that. And lastly, with data, I can store it as the file type that I need. It could be a .osm. Again, if I want to carry the impulse response with me, being able to open up an open sound meter file later, this is not exporting the whole project, just this individual trace. I can do it as a cal file, which I think is, you can open with Rumi Key Wizard. I could do a .txt, which is ASCII friendly, so I can open that in smart. .csv, that's it as well. .frd. No, the, the .cal is the calibration for a microphone file. So if I want to create my own mic calibration and save that to offset something to zero, that's how I would do that. The .frd is for room EQ wizard. And then I have .wave. So I want to have this impulse response as a .wave, which then I can put in a convolution reverb and convolve it and be able to hear what something sounds like through that. So it's pretty cool. So I like the, all those file formats. Again, the metadata is awesome. The timing, the delay, the gain offset, the interface I was using, the reference and measurement channel. It tells me the log time window. So I love all that metadata that comes with a file. Let's move on to math source. I can add that with command M or go file add math source. And that lets me either add, subtract, or average two measurement points together, which is awesome. And I can do vector, polar, dB, or power <laughs> addition. Most of the time I use vector, there are certain use cases for the other ones, which I won't go into here. If you just say, hey, I just wanna pick one and go, go with vector. And I can choose the number of traces that I can add. So for instance, let's go to this store number four, which is what you see here, the orangish line. And let's add that together with my Reaper EQ that I captured. And I click on this and that shows me what that data would look like if I were to add it together. That's super cool. This caveat here says the sources must have the same transform mode and I think also be at the same sample rate. So that's the, because it has to add the data together. If there's more rows in one piece of data than the other, it doesn't like that. So just make sure you have similar settings if you want to do this with that. So you can have up to 10 things that you add together, which is pretty cool. Here are some basic chart properties. I can increase or decrease my Y axis. So if I were looking at my subwoofers specifically, I'm gonna bring up the subtrace. I usually look at 20 Hertz to 400 Hertz. That zooms in right here, and this is per graph. So I could jump here to phase as well and do that and really take a good look at what's happening with this sub. I also do the same vertically. So right now this is a minus 18 to plus 18 dB range. I could reduce this to minus 12. Looking at impulse response specifically, I can also change the X axis and Y axis. I can look at it linear or log. Most often I'm looking at it linearly and I can also select a different source. So from here, I can look at this impulse response of whatever I have selected, uh, all either select a specific one or do all. We're seeing both the Reaper look back and stored number four. Let's go to RTA. So this is now looking at the live measurement. Again, I can adjust the X and Y axis. I can make it go from 140 all the way up. I can save the chart as an image. This is pretty cool. If I go to desktop, name it. Now I have whatever I was looking at here as a nice PNG. So I don't have to trim out anything. It gives me the graph ranges, doesn't show me the toolbars. So that's pretty cool. I could put it in line bars or lines, which is pretty cool. I got to hold the peaks. Yeah, pretty cool readouts here. And again, I can select the sources that I want to see here. Moving on to magnitude, 
we have our EQ here in Reaper working for us. So we're seeing that magnitude reflected. You can change the X and Y axes. I can invert the EQ. If I wanna see the mirror image of it, I can see a linear or log Y axis. I can see the points per octave. This is the same thing as smoothing. Let me pull up this guy here. So this is pretty ugly data, it looks like, at only 48 points per octave. If I move it to third octave, that gives me a much smoother picture. Uh, be careful with smoothing. It is not an end all be all, but sometimes it makes some data types easier to read. The coherence means we're using our coherence threshold to blank out some of the data that is not good. So if I have a value of 0.7 over here, that means something that had a more than 70% coherent value between my measurement and reference signal is gonna be shown here and then be faded out if not. So we're gonna see a little bit more data if I lower it to 0.5. 0.25 and see that coming in. If we bring it to 0.1, that's virtually all the data that's shown there. If I have it at 0.9, so a really high coherence value, not a lot of it is here because not a lot of the data made it above that amount. So co coherence is an estimation of the likelihood that the measurement and reference data are correlated or related to one another. So if it's not really close to each other, that means it's bad or at least misinformed data. It's usually a room reflection, a reverberation happening or something wrong with the measurement system itself. You can also capture a picture again, just like on the other chart and you can select your source. Here's our phase chart for that same trace, X and Y axis adjustment. I can also rotate the phase. This is helpful if I have a polarity inversion. I don't have to look at the top and bottom of the graph the whole time. I can bring it 180 around and look at something a little bit different. The range, I haven't been able to get this to change much with anything. So I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong there. Here's our smoothing again, or the points per octave. This can show plus or minus 180 or from zero to 360. If you're a crazy person, but plus or one, <laughs> minus 180 is what most of the industry uses. We can use coherence or not, bring it all out, have our coherence threshold and here, are our, here is our source selector again. Here's our coherence chart. If we are high up on this chart, then we are in good shape. If things are low, this is not good data. So for this particular trace, most of it made it above the, I would say 70% mark, which is, which is pretty good in my book. This gives us some, some data we can work with. I can adjust X and Y axes again, and I can also bring down my help line. What this does is shows me where, just gives me a guide to see if my coherence is above a certain value. It's not gonna change any of the data itself. We have smoothing, we have squared, and signal to noise ratio. I don't use those very much. I'm usually on normal here. I can save this chart and select my source. Here is our spectrogram. This is a great thing to read out live if I wanted to see what's going on in that environment, I would switch over to FIFO because that's a much faster reacting way of averaging the data. I click back on the chart, I can do my X and Y axis range. I can see how long the chart is. So it's four seconds of data that I'm seeing, the amount of smoothing that's being applied. So I can make that more granular. We are just seeing pink noise here. So there's not gonna be anything crazy as far as variance. I can change the blue to green to red transition and then I can look at only this source. If I hit Command W, I can see here at the bottom a wavelength calculator. This shows me that 100 hertz is equal to a one millisecond period or cycle. It tells me the wavelength in meters and it's half wavelength. So if I start to increase that, we're gonna see that change. So I'll bring it down to 500, that's doubled. 250, that's doubled again. 125, that's doubled again. Starts to give me that. It's all in meters, or I can change it to feet, which is pretty handy. So 100 foot, or 100 hertz wave, it's gonna be 11.260 feet. At that given temperature, you can make the temperature hotter or cooler to be what you normally do. I usually do 72 degrees Fahrenheit or 22 degrees Celsius. You can also right click, and I'll tell you whatever you right clicked on, it'll bring up that frequency in the wavelength calculator and give you some data. You just gotta hit Command W and get there. One of my favorite features here is the target trace. I hit Command T and I click on that. It gives you some neat little brackets that show you where you wanna go. So 
this gives me a place where I can, before I listen to a system, start to EQ and move things into to fall in alignment. So if I know all my traces fall within this, I'm a happy camper, or at least I know the system is off to a great start. If I click on target trace, I can adjust its properties. This is the width of it. So if I have 9 dB, that's a very wide tolerance. Or we're gonna make it nice and tight, 3 dB. And then each of these segments, so the, the first segment is here, second segment is here, third is here, and that tells me each of these hinge points. So right now I have it a breaking at 100 hertz and 1000 hertz. This gives me a good target to shoot for with the system. So it's 6 dB over on the bottom, 6 dB under at the top. I don't use this for every system, but if I just pulled up anything in, a, in an average sounding room, I'd probably start here and listen to see what it sounded like. Up here at the application menu, hit file, uh, a new open sound meter file. This would close this project. I can save this current open sound meter project. I can open another one. This means opening a complete OSM project that would have all these traces in it or I can import an individual trace that I've exported as an .osm file into this one, either way. I can select recent projects. I can import a .csv or .txt file. I think there are other types, but those are the two main ones. You can add a measurement, so that's adding another transfer function, if you will. You can add a math source, so that's our, right now, we looked at earlier, our vector sum. We can add, add an equal loudness contour. So that's command L that shows us an equal loudness curve uh, across our magnitude. I'll bring that back here and zoom this back out. It shows us an equal loudness contour across right here. And then we can toggle our target trace with command T if we want to have that shown or not. Going up to view, we can do dark mode or not. I'm blinded now. <laughs> Command W does our wavelength calculator and that changes this property bar down here to that. Then we have our hotkeys menu. So that's right here with shortcuts and this is every hotkey in the entire software right here. I like that they're all command something based. I don't have to remember option command A or control option H or whatever. It's, it's just command this, command that, command this. There's no single key ones as well. It's always command this, except for the F1, F2, F3. So I like the simplicity of that in my mind. Now that we've stepped through the entire menu, all the functions of every tab, uh, I'm now gonna simulate what it would look like to set up a measurement from scratch. I'm gonna go ahead and delete all these. And here we are in an empty section, in, in an empty session, I do command A append a measurement as it's called. So I click on it. I wanna choose the interface that I wanna use for this measurement. Right now I'm using loopback audio, which is grabbing audio from Reaper. And here we are. I already have, I have some delay over here in Reaper. I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Right now we're just seeing the EQ move and that is here reflected in open sound meter. I've got another video that walks you step through step how to set up a speaker and a measurement microphone with open sound meter, get a measurement. Uh, but so make sure and check that out if you want to use it in a measurement rig, but that's how you get up a measurement source, select the right interface, make sure you have your measurement channel, which is what you're doing the changes to. And then your reference channel is your pink noise most of the time without anything done to it. Make sure it is synced here, applying the estimate delay if there's any delay offset. And now you can look at your data in all its glory. Thanks so much for tuning in today. My name is Michael Curtis. And if I could do anything else to help you along in your audio journey, please let me know below. Uh, I know this was not absolutely comprehensive. It doesn't talk about how to read the data, how to get it, but I hope this helps you understand Open Sound Meter and how it works a little bit more. Download it, donate, su support Pavel. He's doing some really amazing work. Uh, I'll catch you next time. Thanks.